Right then, so we are shouting about shared ownership. For more and more people, shared ownership is becoming one of the most accessible ways to own a home, and it might help you own a home. Just as it's evolving to allow even more people to use it as a way of getting on the property ladder, it's obviously also picked up a few naysayers too. So we're going to address different aspects about shared ownership in today's market and hopefully help you understand why we believe in, in it uh, so much as a solution towards affording your next home. So with me is Hannah Harding, who works for the Platform Housing Group uh, sales department. Well, technically, Hannah, you're just platform home ownership, aren't you? Yes. So that is you. Sort of, yeah. Yeah. Um, they help loads of people every year find a home. Plus, more importantly, you actually own a home through shared ownership. You want quite a few staff members who do actually, aren't they? Yeah, so just tell us about us. tell us about your house. So I have a two bedroom house in Worcester. Um, in sort of close to the city centre. Um, I have, I own 40% of it, which my house was a resale when I bought it. So when we say, we talk about it a lot in our team, when we say resale, it's not a brand new build, it's where somebody's lived in it before and mm. they're selling it on. So I bought it from a shared owner, not from platform. Um, and then platform own the 60% that I don't own. So I pay a rent to platform for that share mm -hmm. and does that work out almost the same as if you would have gone out and bought a house, house straight up I suppose so I know it's definitely cheaper than if I was to rent that same house mm -hmm. um, because I think in total I pay less than 600 pound in the rent and the mortgage together whereas if I was to rent a house that's I think it's six years old sort of near the city centre you'd probably be paying more than that. And for a lot of our customers, it does. It's not always, not guaranteed, but most people do end up paying either the same or less than they would if they were to rent the same house. So it does, it ends up better off for a mm -hmm. lot of people. So the whole point of this series is we're going to give you three different episodes exploring things you might want to know about shared ownership. Mm -hmm. So we'll explain how it works. We'll address the stigmas around it and we'll also look at the opportunities for more people to use it. This episode is purely about explaining it, which is why it's great that Hannah's here because she, she knows the inside out of it and she lives it as well. So it's perfect. So Hannah, am I right in thinking that sort of shared ownership has been around in sort of loads of different forms for a long time? I think so, yeah. Mm. It's, I mean, platform in its various forms have been, we've got records that go back to definitely the early 90s of selling shared ownership in diff slightly mm. different forms. I think it goes back further than that as well. So it's always been around, but mm -hmm. it's not necessarily something that people have known a lot about until kind of the last few years. Because mm -hmm. even when I started working with Fortis, sort of in 2017, start of 2017, I didn't know what it was. It wasn't until I actually worked in the sales team that I actually understood what it was. So even working for the company that provided it, mm. I had no idea what it was. And a lot of people, I think, are still in that position. They mm -hmm. don't understand what we do. Well, hopefully this will give people a little bit of a better idea about what, what it means to, to do it that way. So, so if you can kind of sort of sum it up, what, what does it mean to own somewhere through shared ownership? So you buy a share what you can afford. So typically it's between 25 and 75% shares. We do an assessment to check what is affordable. So nobody buys more than is sensible for them, No, like more than they're sort of sustainably can afford. Obviously yeah. things do change and life happens, but the, the checks that are in place are there to make sure that, you know, as long as there's no drastic changes, you can afford that property for a long time. And that determines what people buy. So some people come to us and they want to buy 75%, but they might only be able to afford 40 or 50, which is absolutely fine. Mm. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with owning 25%. It's just whatever you can afford. And then you can buy more of it later on. You pay a rent on the share that you don't own. So the rent is determined by the share. Mm -hmm. So as the share goes up, the rent comes down. There is a service charge in... Well, I would say all cases. I've never come across one where there isn't sort of... Because the service charge includes buildings insurance, which is always there. Mm -hmm. And then you have various other things that 
can be included depending on the site. So yeah. buildings insurance is a guaranteed. Yeah. And then there's things like grounds maintenance and maybe a management company. I, I, so it depends, but yeah. that's paid by everybody on the site. So yeah. whether you're a shared owner, whether you rent a house or whether you own it mm -hmm. outright, everybody who pays that service charge will pay the same. Yeah. So that's even across the board. Do you think when you know, because when you go through the whole process of buying a house, those are some of those extra things that you maybe don't don't think about or yeah. don't always account for. There's a lot of extra things like that. So I suppose in a way, it's quite a nice thing that those are kind of included in what yeah, you're Yeah, because with do. the checks as well, we account for things like solicitor fees because mm -hmm. a lot of people, they don't realise how much a solicitor costs because yeah. it is quite a hefty charge mm -hmm. and people yeah. don't realise. They don't necessarily realise that on some sites they have to provide their own carpets. Mm -hmm which again is another, so they may well have enough money for their deposit, but they might not actually have the extra to make it realistic and possible to buy that house. Mm -hmm. So all those checks are there. Sometimes it's disappointing when people can't go ahead, but it's there for their own good because we're not gonna let somebody buy something that's gonna put them into mm. a pit of debt or something yeah. where they're struggling to actually even furnish the house because that's not the point. Yeah. The point is that people get something that they can afford. They can live there for as long as they want to. It's it's their home forever if if they want it. On the staircase and thing, are there mm -hmm. are there caps on that? Can you only so, you know? Can you only get to a certain point? Can you always go so the whole way? Or it's that's a, yeah. So there's a, there's a few different answers. So generally, with the new properties now, you can generally always own up to 100%, but sometimes the lease will stay in place and sometimes you can get the freehold. So if it's a rural location, um, it's what we call a mandatory buyback clause. So in the lease, it will say you can buy 100%, but the lease stays in place so that if you then sell the property when you own 100%, you come back to platform and say, we want to sell our property, we buy it back which means you've got a guaranteed buyer as well, because some people see it as a negative, but I always think you've got a buyer. 100% mm -hmm. yeah. you've got a buyer. We buy it at market value. Mm -hmm. And then the point is that we then resell it. So it's sort of where recycling the properties, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So you're getting, so otherwise, if everybody can staircase out to owning the freehold, those shared ownership properties just disappear into the general market. And then in order to have more, you're just building more and more and more. So by keeping some, you still got the lease in place, but you can own 100%, but then when you do sell it, we buy it back. Mm -hmm. That's not all properties. Some of them you can buy 100%, you get the freehold sorted, very mm -hmm. simple. Um, it's There are some sort of loose rules on what properties are under that mandatory buyback, but it's it's not a one size fits all. It tends to be more rural locations. So cities, yeah. we're fairly safe. It's usually a freehold one um, when you staircase, but some of the more rural places, it can be a leasehold still. But if anybody wants to ask us more about which areas that covers, we can yeah. we can always go into that. And we when we release properties for sale, we always have that on the marketing mm. and we'll check that so we can always tell which sites are under that and which aren't cool so does this work for everyone what's the, what, what about the different people that it, it you know it really works for i mean there's a lot of people because we our customers range from i've had personally i've had people who are single 18 year olds and they've been maybe gifted a deposit to get them on the ladder or they've saved it themselves sometimes we get that as well mm -hmm. or it can be a young couple it's and then i've had right up to my oldest customer was in her 90s so it's it's anyone we've had um people who are just starting families people who have come out divorces and have had to sell a family home and then the money they've come out with they can't afford to buy a full mm -hmm. property themselves anymore so then they sort of this allows them to re-enter the market. So it's kind of, it's getting people into the market, but it's mm. also people coming back sometimes. Yeah. So it's, I think there's a bit of a, 
that generally it's for first time buyers, which a lot of our customers are, but it's not exclusively for first time buyers and it's not exclusively for young people either. Mm. I think a lot of people think, well, it's young first time buyers. And we've had lots of customers who are retired, pension age, like, and yeah, my oldest customer was, I think she was about 94. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> it's yeah. it's a lot of people. It does work for a lot of people, yeah. but like you say, there, there, there are all those people. particular situations where people might not have thought it was an option. Yeah, because there's, yeah. there's occasions where it doesn't work. Mm. So the sort of strict criteria is about income. You can't earn over £80,000 as a household. Mm. Um, because then if you do, you're sort of deemed that you'd be able to buy something outright, hopefully. Yeah. Um, you can't be a current homeowner. The mm. only difference with that is if you are a current homeowner, you have to have sold subject to contract in order to qualify. And then if you have sold and you can't buy something else, you can then qualify. So that one's a bit of a fine line. Okay, But, um, it, but it kind of makes it a bit fair yeah, in the system, but, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But then, and then I think the other one is, it's sort of down to like, if you've been in, if you've got any CCJs or anything like that, that, yeah. that you don't necessarily qualify. But a lot of people will qualify on that criteria because... Yeah. And what about, say, yeah. if someone who wants to, like, buy, like, a, you know, you want to get into sort of like a cheap property that you want to, you know, do up and, you know, redo and dismantle. Yeah. There's, there's certain bits around that which don't quite... Yeah. It doesn't quite work for, does it? Yeah. But I think, yeah, for generally, mm. the people who come to us who are wanting to buy and are asking us what this scheme is... Generally speaking, it works for those people because yep. they are in a position where other avenues don't work. Yep. So then this is their option of yeah. getting onto the ladder. Seeing it as the option. So it it, thing, it works it? for a lot more people mm -hmm. than sometimes people think. And just on a technicality, because it's always a big thing around home ownership and having your own house. Is buying and selling any different? Or how how, how is it different? Not massively. Okay. So... Um, with buying and then sort of, so in, when you're selling and you've got a buyer, mm. um, we do affordability checks, like we said before, we check. Um, so it's, we used to do those internally and we don't anymore. That's with sort of a, a financial mortgage broker, but they will check income versus outgoings, what mortgage is available and a little bit more in depth yeah. than that, but that's the gist. That's not much different. Yeah, yeah. Um, to check what what's actually affordable. Yeah. So in some ways it's, I sort of think it's maybe better than just going off and just buying something because you don't necessarily know because the checks aren't as in depth with just going through a mortgage. Yeah, I suppose you yeah. might actually be getting into something that you can't really. You know a bit more about afford. your buyer. You know a bit more so, about where you're going. But yeah, yeah, so it's we do the financial checks and then same with any new build, you pay a reservation fee. So once those checks are done, mm -hmm. if there's then a property that's available that's suitable that you want, we would then send out an offer letter, send the plans, um, all the information that you need in order to make a decision on whether you want to go ahead. Mm. Most people by that point know that they want to go ahead. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a question usually. Pay a reservation fee and then instruct a solicitor. So okay. it's only really the the kind of the affordability checks that are different. But does it, does it limit where you can and can't move to technically as far as what you're looking at? Sure. So, there are, there's local connections sometimes, yeah. yeah. So again, that's not always on every site. Mm -hmm. um, it depends sort of on where the fundings come from, and our that, end and whatnot. But and just for anyone who doesn't know what local connection is, yeah. it's just about... So that's about um, where you live, work or have family living. Mm -hmm. So um, some local authorities are more strict than others, but the general criteria is that if there is a local connection required, you have to either live in that that place at the moment, mm -hmm. and that can either be the district or it can be right down to the parish. Okay, wow. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very sort of individual to mm. the site a lot of the time, but it's whether you live there, you work there sort of with permanent employment, yeah or whether you have close family, which is usually parents, siblings, or interesting adult children, not children, children, which I've always thought was a little bit odd, but yeah. So yeah. some of them are quite strict, but then other sites, we don't have a local connection at okay. all. So we do have people move from out of the area, but I suppose the point of the local connection is to try and allow people 
from that area to buy in that area because if they want to stay where they grew up then it kind of can allow them to do that and it kind of gives them first dibs yeah if you like Mm -hmm. um but with selling it's it's very similar to norms to sort of traditional selling in the fact that the current the the owner the shared owner at the time they have to contact us and we have to do valuations and things to make sure they're selling it at the right price. But then they can go to the, an estate agent of their choice um, or they can market it privately if if they want to. Um, and then they sort of do viewings and whatnot and then the buyer would put in an offer. So when I bought my house, I put in my offer with the seller. Okay, yeah. They accepted my offer. Then I came to was Fortis at the time but platform to say I have put in an offer which has been accepted now you need to do my assessment and they then did the affordability assessment but you actually put the offer in with the seller first and they kind of accept it on the basis that we will then qualify that person so it's again it's just the affordability assessments that Mm. are the difference Um, but I think sometimes they it can seem quite scary, but it's actually a very simple process. It's not that much different, really, from getting a mortgage in principle because you're still having to submit the same information, yeah. really. It's just a little bit more in-depth. And there's certain different criteria because it all comes from Homes England. So there's certain things that that comes from them and we can't change it. We have to follow it. But that's the only difference, really. Yeah. It's It's not... People seem to think that reselling shared ownership must be really difficult but actually they fly out most of the time because yeah. there's such a big demand for it it's just good to know because there'll be there'll be those sort of thoughts that people are wondering about how much different yeah. in theory how similar it actually is probably surprisingly yeah. similar to a lot of people Definitely. about it okay well look thank you for uh sharing your knowledge on the shared ownership bits and bobs hopefully that makes you feel a little bit more like you know more about it and don't forget any other episodes we put together in this series uh, we talk about the opportunities you can explore and also the stigmas that a lot of people have about shared ownership. Uh, And if you want help finding a home through shared ownership, then just search Platform Home Ownership. See you soon. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Rich.